Last September, Nord Stream pipelines were blown up. Uh, you're now in a formal setting. Uh, can you assure uh, the world that uh, no agency of the U.S. government blew up those pipelines or facilitated uh, yes, that Yes, I can. Thank you. This is my first video update from Athens, Greece on this Friday midday. Let's talk about some news. And that was U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken on the record telling the entire world that Nord Stream was not blown up by intel agencies. One problem to that, uh, that statement from Anthony Blinken, and that is that uh, Seymour Hersh in his reporting, he never claimed that the three-letter agencies sabotaged the Nord Stream pipelines. Seymour Hersh did say that the Biden White House, Joe Bidenopoulos, Greece's favorite son, Anthony Blinken, Victoria Newland, and Jake Sullivan, they, uh, They got military personnel, divers, who uh, were experienced enough to uh, successfully do the job, but they were not active military so that uh, the Biden White House would not have to report to uh, Congress so that they could avoid congressional oversight as they were plotting and scheming to blow up the Nord Stream pipeline, as Seymour Hersh reported. So that whole uh, Q&A that you just saw was a whole lot of deception and trickery because the question to Blinken about uh, three-letter agencies, intel agencies blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline is kind of irrelevant because it's not what Seymour Hirsch reported. So you can see that at the Biden White House, Congress, the U.S. deep state, they are trying their best to cover up, distract, ob obfuscate, <laughs> obfuscate the, uh, the reality behind the Nord Stream pipeline sabotage. They really want this thing to go away. They really, really want this thing to go away. So, um, Blinken said some other interesting things during this congressional hearing. He, uh, he said that Ukraine might have to negotiate for territory I thought that was an interesting statement. And let me see if I've got his quote. He was asked about Alensky's plan to take Crimea. And Blinken said, and I quote, I think there's going to be territory in Ukraine that the Ukrainians are determined to fight for on the ground. There may be territory that they decide that they'll have to try to get back in other ways. Blinken did argue that these have to be Ukrainian decisions about what they want their future to be and how that lands in terms of the sovereignty, the territorial integrity, the independence of the country. Blinken added that Washington would like to avoid a situation which simply invites the Russians to reset, rearm, and then reattack following any potential negotiations. So there is a kind of admission here from uh, Blinken that Ukraine cannot win the conflict outright. They can't score uh, a decisive military victory. He is kind of admitting that, and he's admitting that, that one way or another, Ukraine will have to, uh, to engage in negotiations with Russia and try to, to gain territory via by a diplomatic means. He's hinting at that a bit in, uh, in this statement. So in this, uh, in this congressional hearing, 
we also uh, heard from from Blinken with regards to Belarus. And Blinken revealed that uh, the United States is giving regime change in Belarus one more shot. They're going to take another go at removing Lukashenko. And what's happening is that uh, the U.S. State Department, they are preparing some sort of special envoy who's going to be traveling to Lithuania, where the the coup d'etat, the EU, the Western coup d'etat leaders from, I believe it was 2019 during the Belarus presidential election, that's where the coup d'etat leaders are stationed in uh, Lithuania and Poland. And so Lincoln revealed that they have an office in Lithuania where uh, Tikhanovskaya and all of these characters that tried to, to overthrow the Lukashenko government in 2019, I believe 2019, 2019 or 18. Anyway, this is where these, these guys are located and this is where the U.S. Has, has an office and they're going to now appoint a special envoy who will go there and coordinate the plans to overthrow the, the Lukashenko government. And this person is going to have the title of special envoy. And uh, Tikhanovskaya, who was the candidate running opposite of Lukashenko and who was ordered uh, by the European Union and the collective West to, uh, to put together this regime change in Belarus and get protests moving in Minsk, she was actually in, uh, in Washington, D.C., this week, and she was meeting with Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman, and they were planning out the the next moves to figure out a way to overthrow Lukashenko. And they also had Tikhanovskaya make the rounds on uh, on the media, and she was on Morning Joe, MSNBC's Morning Joe, and Mika Brzezinski. She asked Tikhanovskaya what kind of support she was looking for while in the United States. And Tikhanovskaya told Mika, and I quote, the recognition of the Lukashenko regime and recognition of the democratic forces. Regime change is what she's looking for. In other words, she's looking for regime change. And of course, this was a scripted exchange between Morning Joe's Mika Brzezinski and uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. But uh, that is what they are looking for. They are looking for... That's, that's a trolley bus, by the way, that noise. That screeching noise is a Greek electric uh, trolley. I don't even know if it's a trolley. It's the bus that's on the on the electric uh, rails. And, uh, and anyway, um, that is what is going on with Belarus. They're going to continue to, to, to try and find a way to remove Lukashenko. The neocons and the glo globalist neolibs, they never, ever give up. There is no reverse gear. And what this tells me is that if you're Russia and you're watching all of this, well, then you understand that uh, the only way to, to finally rest easy, for Russia to finally take a deep breath and, uh, and relax, is if they achieve some sort of outright victory, not o only over Ukraine, but if they find a way to defeat the neocons and the neo-libs. Mark, Mark Milley also, uh, he was also taking part in this congressional hearing and when he was asked about Alensky's plans to to go after Donbass and Crimea Mark Milley said that Alensky has maximalist and that is the word he used maximalist ambitions those are maximalist goals is what Milley said in other words Milley was saying that this is uh, not a realistic goal of the Alensky regime to, uh, to go all the way to Crimea, Donbass and Crimea. So that was an interesting admission 
from uh, from Milley. Milley is kind of telling the Congress that perhaps the U.S. should uh, should ease up on the amount of uh, of white sugary stuff that they're sending to to Olensky because he's starting to get some uh, some crazy some crazy delusions of of grandeur going. Anyway, we have the uh, the advisor to Ukraine, commander in chief of the armed forces, Zeluzhny. And this advisor's name is Dan Rice. I have never heard of this guy, but allegedly he is advising Zeluzhny. And he said the other day in a statement that Ukraine is preparing a powerful counteroffensive that will shock the world. Shock the world. Referencing Rocky Balboa. <laughs> Rocky, Rocky 1 or Rocky 2. It's going to be a counteroffensive that is going to shock the world, according to Dan Rice. Once again, I have no idea who this guy really is. They say he's the advisor of Solution. I imagine he's, he's a three-letter agency guy. But uh, anyway, he also said that the, that the right time for the offensive, that when the right time for the offensive comes in the spring, Ukraine will have a much stronger army and much better support than a year ago. German publication Bild is also reporting something along the same lines. They're, uh, they're saying that Ukraine is indeed putting together a spring offensive, and uh, that spring offensive is going to be targeted towards the east, Zaporozhye, south, and then east. And then from, uh, and once they move east towards Zaporozhye, they'll move down towards Melitopol and split apart the Crimea land corridor. This is the plan that uh, that everyone is now aware of. So either Ukraine is going to execute this plan and they're telegraphing the entire plan or this is some sort of uh, a fake out. We'll see. But there are reports that Ukraine is amassing big forces around Bakhmut and that they are amassing forces in the south towards Zaporozhye and Kherson and we do know that the military is probing those areas in the south, looking for weak spots and uh, vulnerabilities. So that is what we do now. Now that that is what we do know. Now whether we're going to get to this big, massive counteroffensive that's going to shock the world, we'll wait and see. That is what uh, the collective West and Blinken and the U.S. Congress is betting on. This is their their hail mary event. And I believe that uh, the president of the Czech Republic also said the same thing, that uh, this is the one shot that Ukraine has to, uh, to gain some sort of victory in, uh, against Russia, is this spring counteroffensive. The Czech president also said that uh, the Czech Republic has no more weapons to give. That was an interesting statement. He says that the, that the Czech Republic is all tapped out. They have no more weapons, but he did say that uh, they would be willing to produce weapons. Unfortunately, he stated that in the Czech Republic, they have a very low unemployment rate and they don't have the, uh, the workforce to create new weapons. And he said that if Ukrainian migrants would come to the Czech Republic, and, uh, and work at the factories to create these weapons, then the, uh, the president of the Czech Republic said, come on in and, and you could start working at the factories to create these weapons. That was an interesting statement from the president, Mr. Pavel, of the Czech Republic. So, since we were talking about regime change, another go at regime change in uh, Belarus. Let's, uh, let's discuss a regime change that may be happening in France. We have 
we have million million person protests that are taking plan that are taking place in France at this very moment and all of France seems to just be descending into protest and chaos and the videos that I'm seeing is that everything is just in flames and it's not letting up because we are getting reports that the protests instead of uh, weakening are actually strengthening and uh, they're growing and even firefighters and police officers according to various reports and videos are now joining the protests in other words the firefighters and the police officers are changing teams and they're now siding with the protesters as they protest Macron's pension reform. And so we have protests in France and you know where there's protests, there's, uh, there's support from the collective West and from the European Union, right? The EU loves protests. And so I found some, uh, some statements from very high up EU officials, Jungle Joseph Burrell and Ursula von der Leyen, lending their support to the protesters in France because, you know, the EU is all about protests, human rights, and dignity, and, and uh, EU values, right? So obviously they're going to, uh, to support the protesters in France. And sure enough, here is what Jungle Joseph Burrell said. And I quote, French citizens took the streets to express their aspiration for democracy and European values. These peaceful protesters, protests were strong and moving to see. That is what Jungle Joseph said in a statement. Oh no, wait, I'm sorry. Did I say French citizens? Oh, that was Georgian, Georgian citizens took to the streets to express their aspiration for democracy and European values. These peaceful protests were strong and moving to see. Uh, that was Jungle Joseph's statement when the protests in Georgia, the regime change protests in Georgia were going on. I must have misread that. But, but look, I'm sure that Ursula von der Leyen, the champion of human rights and democracy and EU values on positive, that uh, she is going to come out in support of the protesters because here is what she said, here's her statement. People of France want change and they want it now. Very strong words from uh, the European Commissioner, Commission President supporting the protesters in France, telling Macron that these protesters, they want change and they want it now and the EU is going to support their human right for change. Oh no, wait, I'm sorry. I must have misread that. Ursula van der Crazy, she said the people of Belarus want change and they want it now. In reference to the EU regime change and protests in, uh, in Belarus. I misread that. She didn't mean the people of France. She meant the people of Belarus want change and they want it now. Where are the EU officials supporting the protesters, supporting their right for democracy and dignity and EU values? Where are the EU officials statements? I don't know. I think I'm just gonna have to keep on looking. Since we're on the subject of human rights, human rights and EU values, let's talk a little bit about the, the Hague's ICC, the International Criminal Court's arrest warrant against Russian President Vladimir Putin, because we have two countries saying that they are going to ignore the ICC arrest warrant, even though they are a part of the Rome statute and the ICC. And we have one country coming out and saying that if Putin dares to step foot in our country, we're going to arrest him. So the one country that said they will not arrest, arrest the Russian president if he travels to their country is South Africa. 
South Africa will not arrest Putin. And uh, Putin has been invited to South Africa officially to take part in the BRICS summit that will be held in August. It'll be held in August. And South African Foreign Minister uh, Naledi Pandor, she said that the Russian leader is expected at the summit. Although the ICC warrant is, and I quote, some cause for concern. But uh, Pandor said that in the past, I have repeatedly pointed out double standards in world problems. There are many countries involved in conflicts, but the ICC was never interested in any of them, she said. Quite an excellent and diplomatic statement from the foreign minister of South Africa, but she made it a point to say that South Africa will not arrest Putin and that Putin absolutely is invited to South Africa and South Africa wants the Russian president to be present in South Africa for the BRICS summit in August. Now, the other country that said that they will not honor the ICC warrant is Hungary, of course. Who else but Viktor Orban and the Hungarian government, or at least the Viktor Orban Hungarian Prime Minister Chief of Staff. This is what the Chief of Staff said. He said that Hungary will not honor the ICC arrest warrant and would not arrest Putin if he entered, if he entered Hungary. Uh, Gergely Gulyas, Chief of Staff to Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, said during a news conference in Budapest that arresting Putin would contravene Hungarian law because the country has not enacted the statute of the International Criminal Court into its legal system. Gulyas said the statute of the ICC, of which Hungary is a member state, was in conflict with Hungary's constitution and that arresting Putin would therefore violate Hungarian law. Orban's government has not yet taken a position on the warrant, but Gulyas said he considered it counterproductive. Now, the one country that uh, absolutely will arrest Russian President Vladimir Putin if he enters that country is Ireland. The Irish government said that it would arrest Putin if, it tra if he traveled to Ireland. The Ministry of Justice has confirmed that it will comply with the decision of the International Criminal Court, which last week issued an arrest warrant for the Russian president. At the same time, officials acknowledged that it was extremely unlikely that Putin would travel to a country that recognizes ICC jurisdiction. Well, he is traveling to South Africa. Most likely he's going to travel to South Africa. And it looks like he has the green light for, uh, for traveling to Hungary. Anyway, let's uh, continue. This week, the Irish Minister of Justice, Simon Harris, attended a ministerial meeting in London in support of the efforts of the ICC to ensure accountability for Russian war crimes in Ukraine. In London, Harris announced that Ireland would contribute 1 million euros to support the office of the ICC prosecutor, as well as 2 million euros to a trust fund to help victims of war crimes. The funding makes Ireland one of the leading donors to the ICC among EU countries. Quote, we are for accountability for violations of international law, including international crimes resulting from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Harris said. Unless, of course, those international crimes are committed by the collective West, then Ireland looks the other way. But um, isn't it interesting that uh, the ICC, they issue this arrest warrant for Putin, and all of a sudden, the millions of euros start rolling in. Ireland is going to give two million into an ICC fund, and then they're going to give another million to the ICC prosecutor's office. Isn't that interesting how all of this works out? Arrest warrant for Putin? Give me money. <laughs> give me money. Give me money. As Alensky would say. <laughs> 
interesting how all of that worked out. Let's, uh, let's now talk about, before we get to our clown world for the day, let's uh, talk about some Collective West uh, illegalities, international illegal activity. And we turn towards... Stuff is falling on my head. <laughs> we turn towards uh, Syria, where the U.S. currently illegally occupies the northeast of Syria, and they illegally steal Syria's natural resources, specifically Syria's oil. And uh, the other day, we had the Pentagon say in a statement that, uh, that the U.S., they launched airstrikes on targets in Syria, where the where American contractors, American soldiers and contractors are stationed. And according to the Pentagon, this was in retaliation to, uh, to an Iranian UAV. In other words, an Iranian drone, according to Lloyd Austin and the Pentagon, an Iranian drone, it, uh, it killed one American contractor. So I guess... When they say contractor, they mean uh, military, a paid military uh, contractor, a PMC, a mercenary, I guess is what they mean. I'm not sure. And this drone injured several more people. The last count I heard was five. It injured five military personnel and people in on this uh on this military uh, base, this military, this occupied military area. So uh, Lloyd Austin said that U.S. Central Command forces retaliated with precision strikes against facilities in eastern Syria used by groups affiliated with Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. The airstrikes were conducted in response to today's attack, as well as a series of recent attacks against coalition forces in Syria by groups affiliated with the IRGC, Austin said. Overnight video on social media purported to show explosion in Syria's Deir Ezzor, a strategic province that borders Iraq and contains oil fields. So the U.S. is attacking Syria because U.S. contractors and military personnel were hit by an Iranian drone in an area where the U.S. illegally occupies and steals the oil, illegally occupying Syria and stealing Syria's oil. And because the U.S. is illegally occupying Syria and stealing their oil, and there was allegedly an Iranian drone that killed a contractor and injured five, the U.S. launched airstrikes against Syria, a sovereign country that they're illegally occupying and stealing their oil. That's the general summary of what is going on. So is, is Ireland going to, uh, are they going to, to place sanctions on the U.S.? Are they going to, to tell the ICC to issue war crimes against Lloyd Austin? I don't think so. I don't think the, the Irish uh, justice minister is going to do that. <laughs> anyway, let's do a clown world and wrap this video up. We return to France and we have uh, a video that is going viral of French President Emmanuel Macron. He was, uh, he was uh, doing a, a TV show. He was appearing on some sort of TV show in France while France is protesting and burning. He went on TV and during this, uh, this appearance, Emmanuel Macron, he sudden re suddenly realized that uh, he's wearing an 80,000 euro or eighty thousand dollar watch that is what macron 
realized halfway during the, uh, the interview. And so Macron very sneakily, sneakily, sneaky, <laughs> I don't know, very, very deceptively, very sneaky boy, that little Napoleon. He moved his hands under the table and <laughs> I guess he, he took off the watch, the 80,000 euro watch, and he, uh, he just started to, to talk again, arms, arms moving about, and everyone noticed, hey, you had an 80,000 euro watch, and now you don't have an 80,000 euro watch. Little sneaky, sneaky Napoleon. <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing there under that table? <laughs> sneaky little Napoleon. <laughs> yeah, that's Macron. You know, it's interesting that Macron had the, uh, had the, the, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? He had the awareness. He had the awareness during this TV interview to, to say, oh crap, I didn't take off my 80,000 euro watch. And if people see me on TV, um, while protests and, and, and France burns wearing an 80,000 euro watch, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be upset. So I better, I better take this watch off. It's not really good for, uh, for optics. So he had the awareness to, to remove it halfway through the, through the TV, to, through the TV show. You got to hand it to him. Anyway, that's the, uh, that's the clown world. That's my video, uh, thedoran.locals.com. We are also on Rumble and Rockfin and Odyssey and BitChute and Telegram. And today I just can't talk. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I made it through the video. Oh boy. All right. Uh, take care, everybody.